so welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever. And welcome back to IP, the IPI Global Network's Virtual World Congress that we've been, um, we've been using to reimagine journalism with 2020 vision. And we've been doing that every Tuesday and Thursday since September 15. So there are a lot of sessions and if you've missed any of those, slowly we'll be putting those online, the videos, and we've been covering them in our newsroom as well. And we've taken over this time some, you know, some deep dives with some of the smartest thinkers and doers, looking at some of the really wicked challenges that journalism faces. And they're packed with insights and some solutions, potentially. So um, make sure you take a look and catch up there. I'm Jackie Park, and I'll be moderating this, um, this our first discussion this afternoon, which is addressing one of the core challenges of journalism right now. How do we make local journalism work, both the journalism and the business that we need to sustain that? This, um, and, and I'm really pleased that this is a, a truly global conversation about, journal, about local journalism. Now, this session is part of IPI's local news project, um, which is a research and sharing project. And right now, we're having a lot of conversations with local news leaders on how they're, how they're making things work and, and what lessons we can learn from that. And our aim is to understand and share the emerging lessons on the kind of conditions and actions that are helping create trusted, sustainable local news organisations. And around this research over the next few months, we'll have a number of sessions like this one, uh, where we'll be bringing news leaders together for conversations um, about, about what's working for them. So, as I said, we, this is a, a global conversation and we're coming to you today from Chicago and Washington DC in the US, from Johannesburg in South Africa, from Bangalore in India, and of course from Vienna here in Austria, home of IPR. And today we have four journalists who've all been involved in building sustainable local news. And, um, you know, I'm really pleased to, to have this panel with us. So I'd like to introduce Subud Nagalwa, who was the editor in chief of the famed Daily Dispatch in the Eastern Cape of South Africa, before joining Newsroom Africa as their political editor. He's also the chairperson of the South, A South African National Editors Forum, SANEF. We have Danya Rajendram from India, who is the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the News Minute, India's news portal for Southern India. We have Maple Walker Lloyd, who is a journalist and director of development and community engagement with Block Club Chicago. <clears throat> and we have Kevin Grant, who's the vice president of Report for America Project and our partner for this session. So welcome to all of you. And we've got a lot to unpack today. And, um, and I know that you guys have all got a lot to share. So um, I'll start with you, Maple. And I know the Block Club Chicago had an interesting start. And I wonder if you can tell us about that and give us a sense of, you know, what kind of stories you tell, um, how your journalism is organised and perhaps how, how it's connected with the community that you serve or the community. Yeah, yeah thanks so much, Jackie. So um, just a little backstory, Block Club Chicago, um, we're a nonprofit news organisation and we're dedicated to delivering reliable, nonpartisan and essential coverage of Chicago's diverse neighbourhoods. Yes. And Block Club um, was launched in 2018 by former DNA Info editors and reporters after the site abruptly shut down in 2017. And after a record-breaking Kickstarter campaign and an outpouring of public support, we got back to doing what we do best, and that's covering the city's neighborhoods. And what makes Block Club so unique is that our reporters are embedded in the communities that they cover. So they don't parachute in um, once to cover a story. They're at community meetings um, 
And pre-pandemic, they were in coffee shops, in schools, building relationships um, over years uh, with neighbors. And most of our reporters also live in the neighborhoods um, that they cover too. Um, and we believe this ground level approach not only builds community and trust, but leads to a more accurate portrayal of a neighborhood and coverage of the stories that neighbors care about so much. And, and just tell me, so how many, like, how do you organise the, the neighbourhoods? Is it by, like a journalist is assigned to, you yes. know, a, a, an area or how does it work? Yeah, so each of our reporters are assigned to about two or three neighborhoods. So they have clusters um, and then we have nine full-time reporters and each uh, reporter covers about two to three neighbourhoods. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Danya, so the News Minute has, has a kind of like, I guess, a similar model in that it's serving a diverse audience, but on a much, much larger scale, right? You're covering southern India or the five, five states of, of southern India. So tell us, tell us a bit about why and how you launched News Minute and, and, and what, what's the gap that you're covering? No, I mean, what, what gap are you filling? And, and give us a sense of the flavour of the journalism and I guess how it differs from what's on, off, what's on offer otherwise in India. Uh, your mic, you need to unmute your mic. This is one thing I keep forgetting on Zoom meetings. Okay, um, so for those of you who know, India is a large country where people talk different languages in every state, but the problem is our media, our national media is mainly in Hindi and English, and they're based out of our capital, New Delhi, or our financial capital, Mumbai. So most of these, most of the journalists who work in news organizations also are from these areas. And news per se is largely dominated by what happens in the North Indian states, especially what happens in Delhi or even Bombay. So I used to be a television reporter for around eight years. And I felt that the representation of stories from other parts of India were quite, uh, quite dismal compared to what was covered from Delhi or Bombay, which is why I decided that I would start a website which will cover these five states. I mean, in the beginning, I had no such idea, but so the idea, of course, uh, uh, came that it will cover all the five states. And we will sort of be that, um, that bridge, which will also force the national media to cover stories from the five states. Now, the five states that we cover have four different languages. People are quite different. So it's not like they're also similar. They're not. They have different cuisines, languages, cultures, everything. So they're also very different, but still they are from geographically the south of India. So other than, of course, asking the national media to cover more places of India, I think uh, the News Minute is also a very feminist organization. So we also look at changing the language of reporting in India when it comes to talking about women, children, etc. Now you are muted. Uh, Jackie, you are muted. Sorry, okay. What, what kind of impact do you think that's had on the communities that you cover? And, and I should say, um, I've, we, I've written a story with a colleague about News Minute. Um, so we've, we've had a long interview in the past. And I, I do remember you saying then that, you know, the politics of um, some of the southern states were really different because the regional media was different. So I'm interested in what impact you think um, News Minute has. So if I'm very truthful on politics, I'm not exactly sure because I think when it comes to political coverage, the big impact is made by Indian regional languages. And mm -hmm. we have many media houses in all the five states. Like, for example, one of the state, two states that we cover called Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, they have around 40 news channels, state news channels. Uh, the same is with every state. So when it comes to politics also, we try to take a different approach, but Sadly to say, I don't think even the News Minute has made a big difference in how politics is covered in India. I wish we could, perhaps that should be mm. the next thing that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, Subhu, the, 
the Daily Dispatch, where you were editor in chief for some time, I mean, that, that's really quite different because I think, you know, News Minute and Block Club are both quite new startups. And the Daily Dispatch was what started back in 1872. And, um, and it has a very famous editorial history. So I guess this comes with a really different set of challenges, like, you know, really navigating that digital transition, perhaps that rather than riding a wave, you know, on a startup. Can you talk a bit about, about the kind of journalism that, that you do, that, that you did there or, or that the dispatch does and how, how that has changed? Okay, um, thank you, Jackie. I mean, the dispatch, as we've said, it's an old um, institution, um, which has actually um, been, is actually, I would say, um, it's ubiquitous, it's, 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 it's in a way um, cemented itself as, a, as an authoritative newspaper in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. And the interesting thing about it is that it has lived through all these years. And when we speak about South Africa, which is divided into nine uh, provinces, um, there is always a reference to the Eastern Cape of South Africa as the corruption capital of the country. Uh -huh. And when we look at it in within, from the media perspective as to why is that, well, how could it be that you have one, uh, one locality or one province where there's more corruption than another province when they are pretty much led by the same governing party. And my theory is that it is because of the good, credible um, investigative journalism which the Daily Dispatch has continued to churn out over the years. And I must tell you and, and, and our colleagues that actually the Daily Dispatch is known for, not only for its famous editors and its age old associations um, with a progressive movement, but also more importantly for its investigative journalism. And part of that investigative journalism is what um, has put, put it on the national spotlight in terms of uncovering corruption in that province. And I think as we are discussing here today, um, local media and its impact and how to innovate in, the, in these difficult mm -hmm. times, one of the things that we have found is that um, because it's a newspaper in a very poor province where there is very little digital penetration, but also the biggest hindrance in South Africa also being the high cost of mobile data. That has been some of the challenges in terms of in as much as the print circulation is, um, has um, contracted dramatically over the years. What we have seen in recent times is actually the, 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 the higher growth and the fast growth of the digital platforms, um, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the challenges that we are facing. But I think be that as it may, what you see in, a, in, in, in local publications like the Daily Dispatch is no different from what is happening in South Africa and in other parts of the world where COVID-19 has actually um, decimated and those industries and actually um, thrown out of the window the whole business model which has sustained us over the years. Mm. So, so how, is that, how has that kind of impacted the journalism? And, and even before COVID, you know, like with um, declining circulation and and loss of advertising, which had been the, the main sort of revenue stream. What, how did that sort of impact the, the journalism? I mean, did you have to have a look at whether you could continue, you know, doing that sort of broad range of, of coverage that it had in the past? Um, obviously, it had a very uh, a decline uh, even before COVID-19, actually, just to give you a bit of a statistic. One of the studies that were done um, here in South Africa was look at the number of journalists that we've lost over a 10 year period from 2018, 2008 to 2018. And actually found that the number of journalists in this country has actually halved from about 10,000 in 2008 to mm. 25,000 in 2018. And now come, in comes COVID-19 and within three months in this country we have lost no less than 800 jobs in journalism. So you can just imagine the amount of pressure that that has placed on newsrooms and the threat that it, it poses to the sustainability of the media industry, even beyond COVID-19, which is actually what, um, as the South African National Editors Forum, has forced us to actually start conversations about mm -hmm. how do we ensure that we are able to have a credible, independent, um, and authoritative media industry, even beyond COVID-19. Now, to go back briefly to the Daily, daily Dispatch, 
uh, the reality is that it, 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 over the years, its newsroom has shrunk. But what has remained though, is that it has, remained, it has been able to withstand those pressures where you still have a, the one trusted voice, because I think trust is the most important thing mm -hmm. here. And that kind of history and that relationship with the community itself is what sustains it and what makes it able to still have a very good, although smaller investigative unit, which is able to um, expose some of those um, gov excesses in government or corruption in private and, uh, and public um, institutions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, Spoo. Um, Kevin, now with Report for America, you're, you're trying to solve a big problem, right? <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit how, about how you, you know, found yourself in that space and, and you know, how, what you see the solution or your contribution through Re Report for America? Absolutely. Thanks, Jackie. And, you know, we launched Report for America in 2017 in response to this news desert crisis. And, you know, the, the numbers that we're looking at look remarkably similar to South Africa, India mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Um, you know, our, our stats say that there was a 60% decline in reporting jobs uh, since 2000, even before COVID. And then at, since COVID, 36,000 additional layoffs, furloughs, and pay cuts. Um, so, you know, it's a dire situation. Report for America was founded to try to turn that tide. And actually, we've been growing quite quickly. Um, sort of focusing on partner newsrooms, including Block Club, um, that have a real public service mission and want to create new reporting jobs on critical beats uh, and communities that have not been served as well as the news organizations would like uh, to, to do. Um, so we started very small, just three reporters in Appalachia mm -hmm. um, in 2017. We've already grown to 226 reporters in more than 150 newsrooms. And you know, what we've seen is that the impact of even a single watchdog reporter in a community can be massive. You know, it can be to the tune of, of millions of dollars in investment, um, can expose corruption of judges or mayors or governors, whatever the case may be, and also give residents a real ally um, that I think you know, in a lot of cases, uh, people felt like they had lost uh, amid all of the, the turbulence of the journalism industry, the rise of the platforms. Um, oftentimes people felt like there was no organization to really help amplify their voice and tell their story. Uh, and so organizations like Block Club and so many other public service, public interest uh, outlets have been wonderful partners in this. Uh, so just to, to wrap up my sort of intro, um, you know, our goal is actually to grow to more than a thousand reporters um, over the next five years. And Report for America is actually launched by an outlet or an organization called the Ground Truth Project, um, which has an international DNA. So our goal long-term also uh, is to see if we can sort of bring a version of the Report for America public service model um, uh, to uh, international partners. And we're excited about that uh, possibility. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you're, you're already kind of looking at that, aren't you? Having some conversations, is there, Anything more you'd like to tell us? I know it's still, you know, some time off, but. Sure, and we're not quite ready to announce, but we've been having, we've been on what we've been calling sort of a listening tour, speaking with journalists in India, uh, Nigeria, and Brazil so far, and mm. really want to have a bunch of additional conversations, try to better understand the news needs uh, in various countries, even as we try to better understand the news needs in our own country. Yeah, oh, good. So, so potentially News Minute or Daily Dispatch, you know, you could look at actually if there was a need helping to place journalists there. We really hope so. And we, we hope yeah. to continue this conversation. Okay. And the, the, the thing, Kevin, that I, that I really like about what you do as well is I think, it's, I think it tries to address another big problem that, you know, that we face globally and that is you know, that are younger people losing interest in, in journalism, you know, and I think, you know, the fact that you're sort of training and bringing people through is also really helpful, right? Well, one thing we've seen, and I imagine that uh, each of my other three esteemed panelists here have seen the same, that when you have these vibrant, dynamic reporters who are working in communities and uh, are telling these stories and are reaching um, audiences through social media, through newsletters, you know, through membership models, 
that that does invigorate, mm -hmm. um, you know, younger people and, you know, develops audiences that might have been lost by a previous generation um, as, as sort of the industry has shifted and the way that we communicate has changed. Yeah. Okay, so what about, um, let's talk for a minute about local audiences and what, what do, you know, what do they value? What, um, how do you understand their needs? And, and I think, you know, going back to what you talked about, Sabu, about how important trust is. I mean, how do you actually build engagement and relationships of trust? Who, Danya, do you want to go first? So I think um, to engage with local audiences, at least here in India, um, the one big problem is representation. How much of a local issue is represented, right? For example, there can be a flood in an area where hundreds and thousands of people are stuck and still find no representation in the media. So there's that kind of anger, which I think now a lot of niche media, media websites, television channels, etc., are addressing. Um, the second thing is, even if a story appears, uh, there is a, I think the problem is the same perhaps in America, um, you have a Donald Trump who's trying to discredit the media, almost the same mm -hmm. thing happened. So there is a lot of mistrust, there is a, which is natural, and of course there is a lot of manufactured mistrust. Uh, so in this scenario, how to actually help local communities is another question. For example, if you report something, 50% do not want to believe you immediately, 50% want to believe you, though it's a very simple news article. So I think these questions of how do you make local communities believe in you, it's, it's not so simple anymore. Like even a small thing which happens in a community, like uh, let's say uh, in, in a place like Bangalore where I live, uh, we put out a story yesterday saying that there is an area in Koramangla, uh, which is a bustling business wing Bangalore that a, a couple, no, actually two men went on a ride and they saw 150 commercial buildings were shut down. It's a very simple story, right? Which you want the local community to engage with to tell them that the pandemic has done this. Mm -hmm. But the backlash on that story was something which I didn't expect. People are saying, oh, you're making it political. All over the world, people are suffering. So I think that even by engaging with local communities, we need to think how to do it and to get their trust we need to ensure that the new story goes as a new story and there is no opinion of the journalists in it, which yeah. I think is a huge problem in India because many times we are not able to differentiate what is a journalist's opinion and what is news. Yeah, okay. Uh, Michael, what's your yeah. experience? Yeah. So I kind of mentioned this um, in my intro about our reporters being embedded in the communities that they cover and not parachuting in. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads to a more accurate portrayal um, of a neighborhood. And also the vast majority of our stories come directly from our dedicated readers. So um, readers know that they can come to us when they want real answers to real questions that impact their daily lives. So if you want to understand and serve a need, just listen to your readers and what they need uh, need from you. And we're confident that if, if, if you keep serving the public, they'll keep supporting your work. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, so as you say, serving that need. And I know that you have a, you're, you're rolling out a breaking news texting service, for example, and a COVID call in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just recently, um, I think at the end of August, um, we launched a breaking news um, text alerts through um, your phone and we have almost 700 um, people signed up and this is just another way for people to be able to access the information that they need quickly and then in the next couple of weeks we'll be launching a COVID-19 hotline where people can actually call in and have their questions answered and unfortunately we're still working out the logistics so we don't have all the answers yet but um, you know it's important that we make sure everyone has the access that they need so many people have limited access to the internet or no access to the internet mm -hmm. at all so we're constantly looking for ways and adapting and adjusting um, to this new norm mm -hmm. and Subhu, is there I mean what what did you learn from the daily dispatch in terms of like you know building that trust and serving you know understanding what the, the needs were in the community so I think so you 
you talked earlier about, you know, off, off you know, line about, um, you know, how you kind of really have embedded, had embedded in the local community. Can you talk mm -hmm. a bit about that? Yeah, so... Um, oh, sorry, sorry, my I was asking Spoo. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you can answer on my behalf, Mabel. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, thanks, Jackie. I think the most important thing is that, I mean, we all understand how easy it is to lose credibility. And it's always an ongoing battle to try and maintain that level of trust because we're fighting uh, globally, not just in South Africa, and uh, the large uh, fake news and disinformation and actually efforts by um, politicians mostly, it's no different in South Africa, who try to discredit the media. Um, so it's always an ongoing, on, on, ongoing battle. But I think what is more important um, in the case of institutions like the Daily Dispatch and generally the independent and uh, media in South Africa is that within that noise, we actually have a very, um, I would say, free space to do the work that we want to do, um, regardless of the noise. But one of the things that we had looked at, actually, in, in terms of making sure that um, we filter through the information, is that part of the discussions that we're having now about the sustainability of the media industry as we move forward is that we've been talking about engaging with government, but also um, private cell phone network providers. There are three main providers in here in South Africa to talk about uh, allowing, having them zero rate um, content from um, credible news sites. Mm -hmm. And what that will do is that we hope that that will allow us to have some kind of a vetting process where, um, we go, because we already have an existing problem of um, high cost of, of, of uh, mobile data, that would allow us to have at least those vetted um, organizations being available for, um, for audiences. But also more importantly, because of COVID-19 um, and what we have seen in terms of the, um, uh, the, 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 the audience numbers. So what you've seen in one, in one element, you've seen print audiences decline, but conversely, um, the audiences for digital news products are skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. So what news organizations, independent of each other, have done is actually, while most of them have got paywalls as we try to be sustainable, is that we've made sure that the part of that content, which is COVID-19 related, is actually in front of the paywall so that it's easier um, to access. And secondly, one of the things that you, we, we've had to do, particularly in local media, um, was actually having um, something similar to what Maple was talking about, which is WhatsApp updates, where you'd have... Um, readers who are interested in their newsletters subscribing to your WhatsApp number and it's actually a tedious process um, because WhatsApp only allows a certain number of people per group. So we actually have a newsroom, we have, we have someone mm -hmm. manning different screens of 200 people each which runs into thousands um, and giving them by the minute updates on breaking news and driving that audience back to your news site. So those are some of the innovative ways that um, have been developed by newsrooms to try and keep the citizens engaged and also allowing them to um, have their voice reflected uh, on the platforms. In fact, the TV station um, that I work for, what we do is what something called Citizen Camp, where on every topic every day, there's always a daily poll and people send in WhatsApp videos and if people love seeing themselves on screen, you know, um, <laughs> and we filter through those. Um, so during a prime time news bulletin, so you'll have five or 10 different comments from ordinary South Africans on whatever topical issue of the day is. And I think that has been a, a working model, which has actually seen our audience, share audience of the news, uh, television news, 24 hour television news um, uh, industry grow to about 20% in just over a year. Yeah, that's, um, d d before I, I go on, I should have mentioned earlier that please put your questions in the Q&A box and do join the chat in the in the in the chat box and and introduce yourself and let us know who you are um yeah i think it's really interesting i think you know as you say the whatsapp messaging and what um block club chicago are doing with their their texting and i think you're using ground source um who 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 i know andrew hay um 
who, who runs that. And it, and it also enables, as you say, a two-way conversation, which I think is really important for local media. Is there, are you doing anything like that with News Minute, Danielle? How do you hear from your audience? Or WhatsApp, but they've become more strict, so you can't send news links to WhatsApp unless you right. register for WhatsApp business in India. So, and WhatsApp business is a very costly thing. Like yeah. you have to really a lot of money to send notifications to so WhatsApp. We are not doing anymore, but we can form Telegram groups and uh, we can do on Facebook. What we do have is a browser notification, which goes, um, and, um, it's mainly through Facebook and uh, Twitter, I guess, as of now. And uh, it's a constant struggle, right? To learn new technologies, new social media sites, new messaging platforms. You never know what story actually works. Yeah. I mean, there are 10 stories I wish people will read. And the 11th story I don't want anyone to see is what gets read. So it's really a mystery to me even now. But we do push the stories that we want people to read the good journalism quite a bit in all platforms, but the WhatsApp thing we are not able to do here in India. There are very few organizations that do it, but the notifications, everyone does the browser and the app notifications. Right. So that really works. Like we have around 1 million people who are subscribed to our notifications. So it works. 1 million people. Wow. And, um, and what about your, your do you, you have a newsletter? Yes. So, um, because we are also talking about revenue models um, in this discussion, to just quickly tell yeah, you. So, well, let, let's go now. Let's go now and talk about your about your business model. Yeah, sure. So, in that, I will talk to you about the newsletter. We do have a newsletter for everyone uh, who has subscribed for the newsletter. We send it to everyone. But other than that, uh, we just rolled out a membership plan. Now, mm -hmm. all this while our revenue model has been basically advertisements. We have some sponsored content. We do videos. We work with, for example, one state government on uh, how to combat trafficking. So um, things like that. And we have an mm -hmm. investor. But we decided during the pandemic that that's not enough. We have to go to our readers and ask them to pay for the journalism. So one was, of course, to have a subscription model where we go behind the paywall. But then we thought if the news minute goes behind the paywall, how many people would want to pay and read us? Because there are so many websites in which at least to be truthful, 50% of our content can be seen, right? Because almost all of us are doing the same content in different ways. So that was not going to work for us. The other thing was to start a membership model. So we rolled out a membership. One is separately for Indians residing in India. And the other one are for NRIs and for anyone else, you're all welcome to take the membership. <laughs> so those who, are, those who become members, there is a forum in which you can have discussions with the News Minute employees, uh, people in editorial and other members. There's also spe special newsletters which they get. For example, the NRIs get a newsletter every day and on what's the big news in India. There is a fortnightly newsletter of arts and culture. What is the development mm. in arts and culture? So it is basically pandering to different interests. And like Maple was saying, we also have a help desk for people who pay a certain amount in the, in the membership. There are different tiers. So if you take the loyalty, then you also get access to a help desk. So if you're an NRI, you have trouble in India, you need a number of a lawyer, anything that we as a community can help you, mm -hmm. we will help you. So mm -hmm. we have introduced membership, which has different tiers and everyone gets different benefits according to how much they have paid. Right. And, and how is that, how's that working out for you now? Like what, uh, what, what percentage of your revenues do you hope that becomes, you know, what, what's your goal with the membership? I have no such, I mean, I personally have no such goal, but the people who look after my funds definitely hope that at least 25% of our, uh, of what we spend is eventually on through memberships. But I don't know. I mean, See, it's a constant struggle, like right? the initial people who will take your membership are people who genuinely love you. They love mm -hmm. your journalism, but there are the others who will need a small nudge. They will ask you, what are you going to give me that you say, oh, you have three articles of mine, so please pay for me. Nobody will do that. They have so many choices. So what are you going to give? So, so then we had to think of webinars where we bring celebrities, politicians, whoever that, that members can interact with. So it's really a constant uh, struggle. Yeah. Okay. And um, with the Daily Dispatch, you you actually introduced a paywall, I think, Svu. Is that right? How yes. did that? 
or, or how correct. do you think how i mean what was the I, I know you probably can't comment like right now but you know i mean up until you were there sort of late last year what was the sort of thinking then around kind of building you know diversifying revenue look the reality is that we face the same challenges as the media in terms of declining traditional advertising revenue mm. and it doesn't reduce the cost of doing journalism so, I mean, one part of the strategy for the company uh, was to first grow the audiences. Uh, we grew our audiences when we were, we were comfortable in terms of the um, all the digital audience we have. We were to where then we introduced the freemium um, model where we put um, it's your um, quality exclusive content behind a paywall and still keep some um, content in front of the paywall so that mm -hmm. can still generate that um, um, that audience, but the reality is there is always reluctance to pay for that content. I mean, if you look at um, New York Times, that has actually had a very successful um, model where they've uh, surpassed their print um, from the last time I checked, um, they surpassed their print revenue. I mean, South Africa is a very poor country. So if you live in a country um, with the poor people, it's not that there's no need, they need, still need the news, they still need credible news. Mm -hmm. But if you have to compare um, the price of a loaf of bread, uh, if it's the last money you have and buying a newspaper, it's, it's a no-brainer as to where that money will go. So it was always a difficult um, business model. And what we had hoped for, even at that time, we're not targeting a huge number. At that time, the research was showing us that the conversion rate um, was around 5%. So for all this audience that you've built, if you're able to get 5%, you are actually lucky. And I still, uh, having left uh, uh, two years ago, I still do not believe that um, they would have reached that point because the reality is um, people, as uh, Dania has said, there are other sources of news, but I think what makes, what, what makes uh, publications like the Dispatch Unique is that they dominate that space. It's an entire province of over 6 mm -hmm. million people and you have this one voice. So if you want that content, that was also part of our selling point. Because if you looked at even our digital audiences, um, the majority of the digital audiences um, for the newspaper came from the urban centers like the Western Cape, Cape Town, and Gauteng, which is Johannesburg. Obviously, that has to do with the large migration of uh, people fly, fleeing the poverty in the Eastern Cape to move to the urban centers in hope of finding employment. Obviously, those are people who care about what is happening back home. And those are the people uh, we're trying to convert uh, in terms of the content offering um, of, uh, of, 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 of the Daily Dispatch. That was the, the major selling point. So we did have some conversion, but it's still not at a rate where it would offset mm. the, uh, the, 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 the print um, um, revenue. Yeah, and, and Maple, I know you, you, you tell, us, tell us about your revenue model at um, yes. Block Club Chicago, yeah. Yeah, it's um, pretty similar to Sabu. So um, when we first launched, we set out um, with a goal to be journalist run, reader funded um, newsroom. So we reached our two year anniversary um, in June and we're over 70% reader funded. So we have almost 14,000 subscribers and we too also have a free freemium model. So mm -hmm. our subscribers pay $59 a year or $6 a month, but all of our South and West side coverage is free. And it's always been free along with our public health, breaking news, COVID-19 and election coverage. All of that is free. And then about 20, 25% of our revenue is philanthropic support. And then the rest is from individual donors and sponsorship ad placements um, in our daily newsletter. Um, but something to also note is we're always constantly um, looking at other revenue sources. So right now our organization is um, in two programs, one that helps with philanthropic, um, generating philanthropic support and then the other is to, to help generate um, uh, support through um, sponsorships. And then we just finished out a program um, that um, taught us how to generate revenue from events. So mm -hmm. we're, we're always looking at ways to make sure we're, we're diversifying our revenue streams. And how, so, so how practical, say, in Africa and India, you know, is this, is this sort of like looking at, you know, things like sponsorship, events, um, you know, philanthropic support? like Maples, you know, looking at with the Block Club Chicago? Uh, I can start uh, with South Africa. Look, we have uh, seen a number of um, 
in, uh, enterprising, in fact, in fact, new um, media platforms grow um, out of all the devastation that we've seen. And there are different models, really. And there are those, there are, there are um, institutions or uh, publications like the Daily Maverick, which is a digital publication. And they've done very well in terms of generating um, that philanthropic support. Um, in fact, up to a point where a month ago they launched a print product. Can you believe it? Who in this day and age would go the route of launching a print product when everyone is moving in an opposite direction? But I think uh, in terms of their model, it seems to work because the argument is simple in that most of the journalism is long form journalism, uh, which gets lost on its own news side. So to curate that onto a newspaper, which is free issue, um, working with one of the biggest uh, um, chain stores, which is pick and pay, um, where if you have a loyalty card for pick and pay, you get it for free. If not, you'll pay 20 rands, which is probably about a dollar or so. Um, and that seems um, to be working, it's free issue. Obviously that poses a challenge to your uh, traditional news, um, um, traditional newspapers, mm -hmm. Sunday newspapers, which are big in this country. So in a way, there are different models. I mean, the, my, my only fear personally is that, it's always that you can always rely on philanthropic support, but for the sustainability and, and, and certainty, it's, it's actually um, never guaranteed. Um, mm -hmm. And also, um, um, you have to find, my view has always been that you have to have a working model which is much more sustainable, which can be through um, paid subscriptions, because that is, um, that is income or revenue that is guaranteed mm -hmm. in terms of how you sell it. And as Maple mentioned, some of the innovative things that we're trying to sell in terms of selling um, a hybrid system of both print and, um, that's what I tried to dispatch, print and digital subscription. We would even give our um, subscribers front row seats because the Daily Dispatch yeah. in terms of organizing um, current affairs, dialogues and all of that. And we have that kind of an audience where if you're a subscriber, you get front row seats and we call in all these um, important people and authors uh, during book launches and all as front, uh, different types of ways to uh, generate revenue. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, Kevin, I, I want to come to you in a minute for your kind of overview perspective. Um, but Danya, what what do you think about some of these other revenue streams? Okay, so in India, philanthropic um, trusts there are very few which give money. I think there are in fact only two or three of them, um, and. Most and some of them have uh, like more they, they will only give you money for three years or four years mm. and after that they will not give. So if you are here in for the long term game, it's very difficult to just get those funds and run the site. So you have to think of alternate uh, uh, resources. For example, like Maple, even if I was running a non profit organization, also it becomes difficult because most of these trusts only give you for three years. So I know a lot of websites which are struggling now because they cannot get those funds anymore. Yeah. I wish more people would start giving money to the media but currently i don't think it's happening uh the other models of course um here many of us work with the ott platforms the movies which come they actually pay quite a bit for you know that's one way yeah. one way netflix amazon prime all these guys mm -hmm. especially because they have regional movies quite a bit so they pay uh, people not to write reviews the reviews mm -hmm. are of course for they, if you don't like a movie, you don't like a movie, that's it. But before the movie comes to write about it, that I think is becoming a huge source of, res uh, of revenue resource for a lot of websites in India. I mean, I'm just trying to think new yeah, things. Which yeah. No, that's really good. And, and um, Kevin, because you, I mean, you're in a kind of a unique position, right? Because you're looking at a lot of media organizations and, you know, assessing which ones you can support and, you know, I'd be interested to know what you're looking for in terms of a business model. Yeah, first off. And, and, sure. and what do you see that kind of excites you? Like, what can you share from what you see? Yeah, so, you know, we are a nonprofit which partners with both for profits and nonprofits. And we're literally working with newsrooms that employ just about every model under the sun. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that seems to run through all of our partnerships is can philanthropy be a catalyst that helps uh, put an organization on the path to sustainability if it wasn't already? And just to say a little bit more about our model. So what we do is we pay half of the salary of a new reporting position mm. as has been defined by the newsroom. 
So the newsroom uh, agrees to pay a quarter of that salary right off the bat. Not so bad, right? Pretty affordable. Yeah. And then typically we partner directly with the newsroom to raise the other 25%. So we actually have sort of an arm of our organization that does fundraising. And, you know, a lot of that is, you know, more traditional philanthropic fundraising, but also crowdfunding. And so we try to sort of work closely to, you know, not just advise, but also learn uh, around best practices for how to reach. Um, so, you know, in terms of what excites me, I mean, without question, you know, what Block Club is doing in Chicago is awesome, uh, which, you know, that diversified revenue model of being able to, you know, not just depend heavily on members, which makes so much sense but then to have other streams coming in, including, as you said, Maple, um, adding events, and then learning about these two other fantastic organizations um, uh, you know, among the, the co-panelists here, uh, clearly are heading in the same direction. So what strikes me is that I think so much of this vanguard globally is heading in the same direction. Um, and so what we are trying to learn more about mm -hmm. with Support for America, and ultimately as we work further in the world, is what is the bottom line look like? If, if a philanthropist invests $100,000 or $500,000 or whatever the case may be, what can that become over time um, through the different business models that are being employed by these innovative outlets? Um, you know, we think that to, if we can't solve that, we'll probably never, none of us will probably get where we need to go. Um, I would just add one other thing, which is our co-founder, Steve Waldman, has joined a group of leading uh, uh, organizations in the US to try to put together some legislation um, that would actually change US law, uh, include actually some tax incentives for uh, you know, Americans to be able to get subscriptions um, that would be able to be like a write-off on their taxes. And so while there would be entirely uh, you know, maintained editorial independence for you know, all the organizations involved, it would actually start to take a little bit of tax money um, and help subsidize uh, greater news consumption. Um, we're also looking at sort of an old, a much older model, which is like the BBC. And while of course, political realities mean that we're not gonna have a BBC in America anytime soon, um, we think there's a lot to learn about sort of journalism as a public service and how that's structured. And, and, and I think it's what, <coughs> excuse me, um, what Sabu was talking about earlier as well, like, you know, really with the data, the cost of, of, of data and how that, you know, actually, you know, works against the sort of pickup, um, you know, the affordability for people who are already paying a whole lot for their, for their data to actually then pay for a new site. And, um, and you know, I think that um, Senef is actually... Um, lobbying the government or the providers on that as well. So we don't, we just have um, uh, 10 minutes left and we have a few questions. Just quickly before we go, one, one thing I wanted to, to say is <clears throat> in our project, one of the things that we're looking at are the external circumstances that, you know, both inhibit or encourage, um, you know, more sustainable local media. And I think, you know, as you say, some of these models like the cost of data, you know, are inhibit. But on the plus side, you know, there are things like what you're doing, Report for America, and what Maple was talking about, you know, with, um, you know, the, spon the programs that you've been in on sponsorship, on events, um, and on philanthropy are all, you know, really sort of well funded and, and well-run programs that really lift the, the um, you know, lift the expertise there. So I think if there's something that we can do to kind of spread that more evenly around the world, that would be really good. So um, just on to some questions. So we have, so I'll, I'll go through all three of them and then, and then you guys can pick them up. So we've got, first of all, how are you all interacting and connecting with your community innovatively? Do you consider their uh, suggestions while deciding the news agenda? And I think we talked a bit about how you were connecting with your communities. I mean, if there's anything you can offer in terms of, you know, whether, you know, audiences get involved, you know, in helping you on story selection um, and how you do that, that would be interesting. The next question, I think, goes to a little bit what you were talking about, Dunya, that you're largely, you know, women, um, made up of, of women journalists and, the question is, how do you 
I mean, it's from Pakistan where they say like, so there are areas where there are just no women journalists. And so how do you really cover women's issues? Um, or how do you change that situation might be more the um, advice you can give. Um, how do you make local community believe in your news? If previously reporters have only, um, only wrote stories that were paid for, that um, may be something for India, not News Minute, of course, but I think there was a bit of a history there. And um, uh, just a couple, what realistically would you like the state of local media to look like where you are in the next few years? And what are the main barriers to achieving that? So that's a lot, and I'm sorry for kind of, a lot of them just came in. Um, but yeah, who wants to, but we've got 10 minutes, so, you know, it's a few minutes each. So who wants to jump in first and just, you know, be aware of the time? The Pakistan question, I can yeah. quickly answer. Yeah, so uh, I would like to tell Esan that Look, in India, um, the number of women journalists have definitely increased in the last 10 or 15 years. In fact, I would say more than 20-30% of journalists would be women in most organizations, uh, in mind 70%. But the point is, women still are not in leadership positions, even in India. In fact, there was last year of with all the news, with most newspapers, channels, and digital websites, it showed that very few media organizations had women uh, in leadership roles. So I think there, um, it, it's not very different for India, Pakistan, or any other country. Now, Pakistan, of course, is a unique problem uh, where um, in many communities in Pakistan, especially in rural areas, women cannot report. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of um, uh, tension and trouble with feudal and extremists. I agree with all that. So that's something which there has to be community pushback, right? I mean, uh, success stories can be written only if communities come together and fight for more information, uh, fight for their media, by fight for their freedom of expression. So that mm -hmm. I think there is no universal solution to what is happening in Pakistan. But Pakistan will have to do a lot of things which other countries have gone through. The communities within Pakistan have to push back and ask for better freedom of expression and rights. Okay, great. Um, and the... Maple, you, I think you already talked about how, you know, your journalists actually go and say, like, I'm going to be in this cafe working today for a few hours. So in terms of an innovative way of being, you know, letting your audience know that you're available, come and talk to me about what stories, you know, you want to hear or. Yeah. Yeah. And like I had mentioned earlier, most of our, the vast majority of our stories come from our, our, our readers. So um, our reporters are constantly looking at ways to, to hear what our readers have to say. So like in our newsletters, we'll always say, reach out to this email um, if you have a story tip or an idea, or our reporters will oftentimes, um, more so pre-pandemic than now, um, but they'll say, yeah, I'm at this coffee shop between 11 and 2 p.m. writing my story. So if you have a story idea or a tip, head on over to the coffee shop and let's sit and have a conversation. So we're, we're constantly adjusting and adapting and, and looking for ways Ways to to create um, our content and our stories. Okay, Danya, you have a question. Follow up for Maple. Yes, I have a question for Maple. You said that you have people from the community who report about the community, right? But sometimes, do you think um, you need an outsider's view? Because people within the community can become very vested in what the community believes, and sometimes you have to force an outsider view. Have you ever felt that? Mm, that's actually a really good question. So mm -hmm. I think um, uh, in all honesty, so when we're reporting, um, we think the best view is from those who who live in that community, right? And so our reporters, not only are they embedded in the communities that they cover, but many of them live there. So they can understand what's going on. And not that an outside perspective is ever bad, um, but we think to make sure a story is accurately portrayed and reflective. So like when you, I'll give you a prime example. So when you look at mainstream media, right? Sometimes 
you see so much negativity in the media about the south and west sides of chicago so much violence so so much crime but there's more to the city um to to the negative portrayals that we see. So what better way to get the insights and the, and the true hardcore facts of a story than the people who live in the communities themselves? So hopefully that kind of answers your question. Yeah, okay. All right, so we, we're running out of time and I'm going to throw then the last question to Sabu and Kevin. So both, if you can just take a two, three minutes each. And that, that one was like realistically, what would you like the state of local media to look like where you are in, say, three years' time? And, and what are the main barriers to that? So, Bu um, Thank you, um, Jack. The, the reality is that um, community media serves a very important, plays a very important role um, in those localities. Um, Maple makes the point that mainstream mostly touches on if there's a big story, it's like that parachute approach where they come in, pick that story, and they are gone. Um, mm -hmm. but the biggest issue for us, particularly in South Africa, uh, over this three, four months period where we've had a hard lockdown, which has now been eased, um, is that we've lost over 80 small publications. Now, that not only disenfranchises um, those communities, but also those, it actually um, shuts out those voices. So ideally, what you would, the situation would like to see is to have very strong um, media products and organizations playing a role in those um, localities as to how you get, you, are, you, you get that and how they are financed mm -hmm. and what business model. It's still an ongoing um, conversation, really. But I think the, the, the most important point is to ensure that when all is said and done, we still have um, credible news outlets. I'll take, actually, I, I like the idea um, that Kevin suggested where they'll be petitioning the government around tax breaks for subscribers of, um, of, uh, of um, um, newspapers or media organizations. Actually, that's a very good idea. And as we're grappling with these questions here in South Africa, it actually becomes an important point for us to consider um, going forward to say, perhaps let's add this in the basket of the things that we'd like to see happen going forward to ensure the sustainability of the industry. Kevin. Thanks, Sabu. I think my answer is really compatible with yours. Um, you know, what I'd really like to see is more and more and more hyper local news organizations spring up in communities all over the country. Um, you know, as I think we all know, it only takes one or two committed people um, with a fairly minimal amount of resources to set up a website, a newsletter, social channels, and begin, uh, you know, that relationship with people who are hungry for news. Um, and, you know, there are some great organizations in the U.S. already doing this work. Um, one is Lion, Local Independent Online News Publishers, mm -hmm. really fantastic. Um, also, uh, INN, which is the Institute for Nonprofit News. And there are lots of other organizations trying to kind of seed the vine and help really interested people come up with those starter resources, the technology and the knowledge, and, and the knowledge that they need to go ahead and launch. So I think what's standing in the way, obviously, there's always a resource question. Um, but sometimes it's just a little bit more understanding of what would it take to take all of my legacy newspaper skills, say, and bring that into a digital world? What should my content management system look like so that even mm -hmm. if I'm not super technical, I can still comfortably start posting stories on my website and then go from there. So that's what I think should happen. You know, maybe a thousand new news sites in the next several years would be on the path to where we need to be. Okay, thanks. And Kevin, what's what's the next steps for your for the expansion of you know the world expansion for Report for America? Yeah, so uh, you know we hope to announce formally in January what this will look like. Uh, we actually hope to have our first sort of uh, international reporters working with local partners overseas uh, starting later in 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, Sabu and Danya, I'd love to speak with you, uh, learn more about your organizations. Um, and, you know, basically we'll continue our listening tour through the end of the year as we prepare for that sort of January announcement. Okay, so we're just okay. about on time. So we'll wrap up. Thank you very much to like a really fabulous um, panel who, you know, have shared so much. We've covered a lot of ground and like all such different models, not for profit, you know, legacy media transitioning for profit and, and you know, so much um, that, we've, that we've learned and shared.